Welcome to Unga Decoded. I'm Michael Igo, senior reporter at DevEx. For the next couple weeks, my colleagues and I are going to bring you inside the biggest global development gathering of the year. Skip the travel, the traffic, and the security lines, and join us for candid conversations with people at the leading edge of global development, global health, and humanitarian assistance. This is Unga Decoded. Don't do it. Stop talking only about the calories and filling the bellies. Talk about the quality and what is needed to really support uh, the development uh, of people. The world is in the midst of a food crisis. While nearly everyone on the planet has seen the cost of food increase or supply chain bottlenecks, some countries are now teetering on the edge or already falling into major food security declines or even famine. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is the most urgent crisis stretching the global food system to its limits. But it is certainly not the only reminder that that system needs broad-scale change. For Gerda Verberg, who leads the Scaling Up Nutrition movement, any successful effort to find opportunity in this crisis has to be about more than just the amount of food or the amount of funding. And it has to put countries in the lead. My colleague Teresa Welsh spoke to Gerda about not letting this opportunity slip away. Here's their conversation. Gerda, you were able to join us here in New York for one of our DevX events, and now I'm privileged to be able to sit down with you again for um, another in-depth conversation. Welcome to our podcast. My pleasure. Thanks so much for for taking the time to be here. It was great speaking with you yesterday, and we um, had the opportunity to uh, you know chat about really important issues and what we're seeing with the malnutrition landscape. And then uh, both of us jetted right off the stage and over to UNICEF uh, for their high-level pledging event. So let's maybe start there. I mean, what was your reaction to the the 280 million for RUTF scale up? I mean, really incredible amount of money. Yeah, it, it, it's an incredible amount of uh, money and it's uh, making everyone hopeful that uh, governments, but also other foundations and sometimes individuals are really uh, aware of what is needed to respond to this uh, big crisis. Um, so this is this is one thing, and and supporting uh, organizations to to do what they need to do to support uh, uh, families and their children is of uh, immense importance. Mm-hmm. The focus, um, and that is also one uh, one of the hopeful things, was not only on curement, um, uh, curing uh, children, but also on prevention of uh, uh, wasting, and that is important as well. Now the big thing that um, is needed as a next step is to work uh, and discuss with governments to prevent stunting because that is the first uh, step in life. Wasting is of course uh, undeniable, it is extremely important, but Mm -hmm. preventing stunting and taking care of your children uh, during their, um, their first thousand days is the most important and governments at country level need to invest and dedicate more um, policy legislation and funding and action to it. And for our audience that might not be familiar with the, the malnutrition lingo, yeah. um, tell tell them, you know, stunting versus wasting. What are the two differences and causes between yeah. those two? Well, uh, stunting uh, is, you have the very technical uh, thing, but stunting is when, ch- when little babies uh, from the pregnancy of their uh, mother until the second uh, year do not uh, get the right nutritious uh, food and, uh, and treatment so that their physical, uh, but also their cognitive development and their potential mental well-being um, is already handicapped for the rest of their life. This impacts um, how they are able to move and how much energy they have, but also how they later as children are able to 
um, to learn uh, in school. And learning and education is, of course, predicting how productive you can be and whether you can be able will be able to escape poverty. P- children who are well uh, fed, well nourished, um, they are very likely to escape poverty because they are strong, they are smart, they find solutions for the challenges they are facing, they are doing better with family uh, managing, including family planning, and they're much more likely to escape uh, poverty and uh, create their own future. So this is so important. And one more thing, it starts with breastfeeding. So make sure um, women who deliver babies are in a good nutritious status um, um, condition so that they can breastfeed their children. I think you just laid out so perfectly why nutrition is the fundamental building block of development. It's something that I really enjoy writing about because of that. If you're spending a bunch of money on educating a child or ensuring they have access to all other sorts of services, but you know that their brain isn't developing right, you're wasting the rest of that money. Indeed. Um, And that's exactly the case. Um, If people, even Minister of Finance, who have never been confronted with complaints about stunting or... uh, But if you explain them why it is important to invest in children during the first uh, stage of life... Um, and you start to talk about the cognitive uh, potential, then they suddenly understand. And I had a minister in Zambia who asked me, why, how is it possible that I have turned uh, 68 years old and that I never be- before was told about um, the importance for the physical and the cognitive development? Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow, that's really striking. And another minister of finance said, all right, let us invest in it because I need a tax uh, income income later on uh, and more tax income is also a signal of more uh, social and economic development. Mm -hmm. And that's been one of the goals of the Sun Movement is sort of creating this environment in which countries are shown the benefits of investing in nutrition and creating a platform for countries to connect with one another over similar challenges and help solve some of these institutional problems. What are you seeing sort of particularly in this moment we find ourselves in so much crisis everywhere? Uh, What are you hearing directly from the countries that you work with in terms of what they need from the international community, as well as what they are looking to do domestically on their own. First of all, I hear and see sad things, but I also hear and see hopeful things. The sad thing is that due to COVID, uh, many people were were in lockdown and uh, to the contrary of what happened in many Western countries, the government was not able to support. There was hardly any social protection. So people have suffered um, because a day without uh, work is a day without income. And the first thing you need to compromise is um, how you can feed yourself and your children children. So that was really uh, a blowback when it, uh, come to, when it came to nutrition and uh, improving data uh, for good nutrition. Um, um, but during this period, um, many of our 65 member countries were able to bring nutrition and food security to the emergency room. And in some countries, uh, they call it the situation room. So now it's part and parcel of every emergency response of a government. So that is a win. But on top of this, we have the different uh, crises, the Russia-Ukraine crisis, the regular conflicts, the climate uh, uh, disasters that are continuing. Think of Somalia, think also of um, um, Pakistan. Uh, it's devastating, but these are not the only uh, one. So it's, it's crisis on top of crisis. And um, we cannot uh, ha- have the luxury of thinking, so we are almost done with the crisis and we are going back to normal. We will never go back to normal. So the hopeful thing is that um, leaders now are looking around and uh, what they observe in their own country is that uh, more and more families are poor. More and more p- uh, families are, uh, are looking for refuge or want to migrate because if you cannot stay home. But also they observe that uh, children are malnourished and nothing is so impactful and telling the story than uh, uh, watching a stunted baby who is too weak 
to sometimes even cry. So it's coming to so many political uh, leaders right now that if you allow your children to be born and uh, stumble uh, uh, in a stunted condition through their first uh, years in life, you are uh, blowing the future of your country and the future of your society. So it's breaking through and more and more leaders are now talking not only about food security, but also about, but also about nutrition, so food and nutrition uh, security. What is happening at the global level is that there's too much talk about food security alone, because then we are talking about metric tons and then we are talking about uh, the funding, etc. Don't do it. Stop talking only about the calories and filling the bellies. Talk about the quality and what is needed to really support uh, the development uh, of people uh, and the important things we already were discussing. What I hope and what I see uh, happening here more and more, also here in New York, is that global leaders are ready to have the conversation with the national leaders. And that is what needs to happen. The Sun Movement is country-based and country-owned. Owned. Governments uh, are taking the accountability when they sign up for membership to have a multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder approach to food and nutrition uh, security. Um, and step-by-step step, global leaders start to listen. And that is the good point. However, um, global level leaders are very often stubborn. Once the crisis is over, everybody is talking about back to where we, are, we were. And in the beginning, we have heard the same solutions as we noted after 2008 and 2009. But we need to keep on the new uh, tracks and support and align behind country plans. The demand is there. The initiatives are there. The educated people are there from the own country. Please respond to the, to the demand and don't push your own priorities or brilliant solutions. WHO says the end of the COVID-19 pandemic is in sight. But with waves of infection still expected in the near future, how are health systems going to cope? What's going to happen to initiatives that were formed during the pandemic? like COVAX? And how is the world preparing for the next global health emergency? I'm Jenny Leigh Ravelo, Senior Global Health Reporter for DevEx. And every Thursday, we bring you answers to these questions and other exclusive news and insights on everything global health in our free weekly newsletter, DevEx Checkup. Visit devex.com newsletters to subscribe. Do you think we we are in danger of really falling back into, you know, these responses from 2008, from 2011 and missing this opportunity uh, not for fundamental food systems reform? Yeah, in the beginning, uh, that was the case. Think about the G7 uh, and their uh, uh, food security uh, partnership. I mean, it's all uh, meant very well, but it's not. It's, it's again, um, uh, one of these approaches that you can predict, uh, but it, that, that happened already uh, 10 times before. But here in New York, I can see that um, uh, people uh, are really listening to each other and that there are some uh, uh, game-changing events, but also, uh, yeah, events and and people and and strategies. So I am hopeful. That's part of my uh, job and also my character, I would say. Um, And as Sun Movement, we will continue to support country demand, to um, um, make the voice of country demands clearer, but also to make the case for more country-oriented solutions. And there is an opportunity, because at country level, you don't need to start from scratch. Exactly one year ago, there was the the UN uh, Food Systems uh, Summit, hosted by the Secretary General. Since then, um, uh, countries have worked hard, bringing all the stakeholders in their food systems together to um, reform food systems into food systems that are producing 
uh, healthy, nutritious, diverse and affordable food, pro uh, provide farmers and food producers with a decent income and uh, that are producing uh, in a climate smart way. This is a win-win-win. It's bringing at least seven, eight sustainable development goals together. It's one investment and it's a country-owned investment. And I uh, can only call upon everyone who has something to invest, use your money in a smart way. If you can serve three or more uh, goals with uh, the investment of the same amount of dollars, it is an absolute no regret. And if you are building the resilience of people and you are creating and supporting the dignity and prosperity of people out there, you're doing a blessed thing. Why do we miss these opportunities so often, though? You know, you just laid it out so clearly as to what the benefits are to doing all of this. Don't ask me. I, I, I don't think it's, it's a lack of, of, for me, of being loud and clear. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's but people are people like to operate from their comfort zone. And if they are in a safe space, they're ready to discuss all the alternatives. But when they are going home, um, they tend to do uh, the things that they uh, did do. And maybe there is also the siloed approach, because if you want to have a multi-sector, multi-stakeholder approach, um, how do you reorganize research? How do you reorganize also your funding? Uh, how do you engage with uh, the, 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 how do you, um, uh, discuss the priorities of your government because every government has its own priority but if you um, are not ready to uh, leave um, your priorities and your requirements at the door or at the border of a country and align behind country initiatives you're only pushing your own agenda mm -hmm. and you're not part of the solution but you are part of continuing the problem because inequality will rise, migration will rise, conflict will rise. And I want to add one uh, more thing, which is um, in the COVID situation, many governments needed to um, uh, invest in social protection, needed to invest in um, uh, buying vaccinations, etc. The debt has increased in many countries. I was in an African country where I had a conversation with the Minister of Finance, uh, because next to the Minister of Health and Agriculture and Education and all these other, I also want to talk with the Minister of uh, Finance to make clear that an, and that um, investing in preventing malnutrition is an investment in the future and uh, curing is only a cost and it's much more uh, expensive. But he said to me, listen, I would love to invest more in the future of my country and my people. However, every year that I get my budget, my national uh, budget, I need to set aside 70% of the budget on, uh, uh, for debt-related costs. And he's not the only one. And it's still increasing because Africa, for instance, is importing food at the price, for, at the price of $60 billion uh, uh, a year. Now, if you would be able to only let's let's say 25% to start with 20, 25% of this 60 uh, billion uh, dollars a year to invest it in improving your own food production, uh, creating jobs, uh, uh, etc., uh, preventing food losses and food waste. I mean, you're stimulating uh, development in, instead of recurring costs every day. And the foodstuffs are there, the original um, foodstuffs like uh, gears, cassava, spelt, emmer, uh, what have you. You have so many of these indig indigenous crops that are, um, are used to be produced in the soil that uh, fit the biodiversity, that also serve the nutrition. Uh, but it is labeled very often as poor people's food because people need to eat bread for breakfast. Um, they need to uh, have high sugary uh, drinks, etc. because that is the way forward and that is... No, it's not. So um, um, if people who want to invest in a better world really think through, then I would say listen to the voices from the communities out there and align behind the people who understand what is going on and who know what they are doing in improving their own life in a way, um, yeah, their own lives in a way uh, that they can own and drive further themselves. 
And one final question for you. Um, you, of course, have announced that you will be stepping down from your role as uh, Sun Movement Coordinator. What's your message to your eventual successor? Um, please keep the movement character because um, um, bringing all these people together and make them work together is not always, is sometimes herding cats. But as long as all these cats are, uh, are focusing on the same uh, result, you're blessed because they, uh, um, they, they take the decision to take one or two steps further than they initially, uh, initially uh, intended uh, to do and continue to, continue to be country uh, uh, owned and focus on solutions that can be owned by the people themselves. Don't make people more dependent. Greta Verberg, thank you so much for joining us here. It was such a pleasure to talk to you as always. We really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was totally my pleasure. Thanks for listening to Unga Decoded. We'll be bringing you more interviews from the UN General Assembly throughout the next week. If you enjoyed today's episode, please do share it with friends, family, and colleagues. And you can also leave us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. If you've been to UNGA and have some thoughts, or if you just want to share some feedback on this episode, we'd love to hear from you. You can find us on social media at DevX and at AlterIGO.